votes, what do you think would be a more acceptable number? Um, acceptable? 70, maybe? Probably 70. Can you send 70? Actually, this is what 70 people looks like. So the majority of you have probably seen this video, probably excluding David, but um, the point of this video, you know, figures is that I guess roadside so drug testing is important be because it can uh, stop one of your relatives or 70 Zero. of your relatives uh, being killed Zero. on the road. So the real question is, uh, whilst uh, these drugs are being uh, tested at the roadside uh, internationally, you know, different ways of testing whether people are driving under the influence, um, do we have evidence that these drugs are actually involved in the accidents? Are they causing the accidents? So we can uh, look at epidemiological evidence, which provides uh, evidence around the prevalence of drug usage in injured and uh, killed drivers, I'm looking at the levels of the drugs uh, in their blood samples. But a, an obvious problem with this is uh, drugs that aren't often as associated with impairing driving, such as antidepressants, uh, appear in a, a significant amount of people's blood samples that are, are killed or injured on the road. But they're more so not implicated in the actual accident. So what would be a better way to uh, look at that? Uh, in my opinion, a uh, better way to uh, look at it is to examine uh, the culpability of the driver uh, involved in the accident. So this is like the police examining the scene for these eight different conditions to get a feeling of who caused the accident, what are the mitigating features of causing that accident. And then if you relate uh, whether the person was responsible for the accident, somewhat uh, contributing, contributing to the accident, so they, it might have been avoidable, but they didn't react quick enough, or if they were not culpable at all, and, and then we relate them back to the different blood samples, that might be a better way to explain the role of um, drugs in driving. Uh, just as a warning, I've got a few clips coming up here which might wake a few of you up, hopefully not disturb too many of you, because I wanted to give a few examples around uh, the types of conditions that might alter the levels of uh, culpability. So in this first one, we talk about the condition of the road. As you can see in this clip, the condition of the road is fine, but the person uh, coming in the opposite direction who's changed lanes at the wrong time is clearly responsible uh, for that accident. And the next one uh, is fairly wet roads, so it might reduce the level of culpability, but you might question the decision making and the quality of the brakes in that particular model of car. Uh, this one's the worst. Um, you can see here that these, well, for a moment you can see these three cars that take off, they have a green light. Uh, that truck driver has a red light. Um, he may or may not have had um, enough night's sleep, uh, or enough sleep the night before. He might have been taking uh, amphetamines, which I'll uh, get to later, but he's clearly culpable. Uh, for that accident. So the next real question is, are we uh, testing for the right drugs? So back when uh, the saliva testing uh, for the roadside was being um, piloted at our lab with the support of Ed Ogden here at the front, um, there was a culpability, culp culpability study run uh, nationally here in Australia, looking at 1,700 uh, injured drivers. 29% of the uh, sample tested positive to alcohol, probably not surprising. 13% testing positive to THC, and 4% to stimulants, and 50% of them involved in these accidents had no drugs or alcohol. Uh, further major concerns, about 10% of them had multiple drugs uh, in their system. And so you would suggest that the, involve, the appearance of these drugs uh, in their system contributed to their uh, involvement in the accident. But we can't really attribute that unless we look at the culpa culpability analyses. So when you consider the people who had just a little bit of alcohol, a legal amount of alcohol in their system, uh, they were only 1.2 times more likely to be re responsible for the accident. Uh, the thing to note is they were, they were three times more likely to be involved in an accident. Though, so you're not 
avoiding the accident when you've had a, had a drink or two and you're under 0.05. It's just something to consider. Um, there's an increased odds ratio of 4 to 4 for people who are over the BAC, uh, but up to uh, 0.08, so a fair bit more likely. And if you're over 0.2, BAC is probably unsurprising. If you're at 0.2 and you find your car, that's probably a good effort. Uh, but you probably shouldn't be driving, so you're 24 times more likely to have caused the accident. Uh, if we look at the illicit drugs, uh, most commonly detected, again, was uh, THC. If you had a small amount, so less than five nanograms per mil in your blood, you're only two, 2.7 times uh, more likely to have been responsible for the accident. But if you're higher, so above five nanograms per mil, um, that odds ratio really jumped up to being six times uh, more likely to be responsible. So these people have we finished a joint or two, uh, had a bit of a think about what they're gonna do next, maybe got the munchies, jumped in the car. Not a very good decision. Um, amphetamine type stimulants, only 1.6% of um, drivers, but the odds ratio of them being responsible was 2.27. If you look at truck drivers, who have a major concern, if they're causing an accident and you're involved in it, you're unlikely to be here listening uh, to me talk about it. They are almost nine times more likely to have caused the accident. There was also a high level of benzodiazepines uh, found in drivers, and they were marginally more likely to be responsible. So, does the presence and their culpability give us the whole story, give us the full causation? Probably not. So our other way that we have uh, examined the effects of drugs and, uh, drugs and alcohol on uh, driving is to con uh, conduct controlled, randomised controlled trials. So in, the, in this trial, we looked at two levels of uh, THC within a cigarette, a joint and how that affect and two levels of alcohol compare that to two placebo conditions and uh, we found that driving simulator performance and surprise news was uh, more impaired in the combined THC and alcohol conditions so this increased the weaving of the car cars leaving uh, the lanes so crossing into other lanes and they're also driving slower initially when they started driving off driving nice and safe and but also on the freeway so probably consistent with the sort of um, experience people might have told you about uh, consuming cannabis and surprisingly a regular cannabis users displayed more driving errors than ones that didn't consume cannabis as often so maybe there was a bit of self-confidence in that but they're still making more errors so there's a bit of a concern there with your longer term users. Uh, we also did some studies looking at MDMA by itself and methamphetamine by itself on driving and so with that sort of stimulating effect you might have expected that uh, people drove faster, broke the speed limit more often and that also resulted in them uh, pressing like heavy braking uh, more often driving sort of inappropriately faster, more dangerous. Uh, they also completed the standardised field sobriety test. There's, uh, three that I highlighted earlier where the guy was falling on his head um, and their performance compromised in that in 22% of them so which I guess questions the validity of those tests for identifying uh, the, the impairing effects of MDMA or uh, questions the validity of it appearing uh, in the saliva test 100% of the time at the same dosage uh, whether the dose that we have and the dose that's detectable on the side of the road uh, is impairing. Um, given the time, I just wanted to quickly talk about what is, what's another uh, alternative measure to detecting impaired driving, uh, whether beyond looking at the blood of injured or killed people. Um, so ocular detection, uh, I believe it's a potentially valuable and viable way of detecting sort of impaired driving, so via ocular activity for pharmaceutical or illicit drugs and might provide uh, early detection and some sort of self-regulating uh, ability to drivers. Um, we're currently doing this looking at a combination of methamphetamine and alcohol, so again on driving performance and ocular activity. We're looking at uh, what is termed gaze entropy analysis, so which is uh, how well you're scanning the, the visual environment. Uh, we've already found it's sensitive to sleep deprivation with on-road uh, trials and as I mentioned this could have been utilised as an early warning uh, system within that um, trial. Well, once we decide on what is an unhealthy amount of visual scanning, I guess. 
Uh, this was published in scientific reports uh, early last year. Um, the gaze entry analysis showed that it was sensitive to lane departures, so predictive of the amount of lane departures, and also uh, was very sensitive to time on task, so a fatiguing effect of driving more and more and more, less uh, gaze, uh, reduction in gaze entropy and less uh, adequate scanning of the visual environment. Uh, this is why there's no slides of mine printed out, because I only did this last night, and it's not great quality, but if you look at the bottom right uh, pane there, uh, that's when you're just normal driving, no alcohol, no methamphetamine on board. Uh, the pane above that is when you add alcohol, is marginal change with this amount of alcohol, is very early uh, data, but then when you add uh, methamphetamine in the top left with alcohol, you can see a real big change in the scanning um, distribution and the level of concentration of the scanning where you should be looking straight out to uh, in front of you when you're driving. Uh, where early, well, last night I attributed this to less, visual, less efficient visual scanning, similar to the tunneling effect that uh, truck drivers uh, report when they do take uh, methamphetamine. They're driving along, concentrating on driving uh, straight ahead, probably like that footage I showed earlier, but sort of missing the obvious cue of a red light over here, which you probably should have stopped at. So the future examining ways to detect compromised driving performance via ocular measures. Uh, we're currently running trials looking at benzodiazepines plus alcohol, methamphetamine plus alcohol, and also looking at instituting GPS and driver assistance tracking into uh, patients newly uh, prescribed benzodiazepines and other type of, and, and the opposite, say weight promoting uh, drugs with partners at the Austin Hospital. Uh, my apologies for finishing very quickly. And again, thanks very much to David Castle and to Cyxene for the invite today and hosting everyone. How long after? You're better uh, set to answer this one for me, Ed, but I wouldn't, it would be, it depends how much you smoke over what period, but you wouldn't be smoking uh, the same day. You certainly need to uh, sleep and you probably shouldn't drive in the morning just in case. Not that I'm suggesting that you should be smoking. Should we test for antihistamines? Um, not really. Uh, the more, uh, the early, early ones were a little bit more dodgy on uh, driving performance, but the more recent ones are pretty good at, well, treating your problem, but also not affecting uh, your general cognitive performance and related performance in driving. What would you say uh, that doctors should do in terms of advice about driving? Um, well, with all new prescriptions, there, there are some obvious drugs like the benzodiazepine family, uh, for example, where it takes a while for you to get used to the effects of those drugs, get the right dose. Um, that comes with a warning that you shouldn't be driving initially until your patient feels as though they should be capable of driving, they shouldn't be driving. Um, I would always err on the side of giving them time to get used to these particular drugs. Uh, even with, say, uh, more weight promoting ones, these, like Vossa, are going to keep you awake. Uh, they're, 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 they're strong drugs. And so you should probably take some time away from driving, ease back into it. Uh, this is why we're trying to run these studies. Uh, out of Yostin at the moment to try and see how big a problem it is, particularly for short-term treatments, because uh, you don't want to get the right treatment and then create another problem through a simple accident of driving a car. Thank you. Please <laughs> thank Luke.